Good morning. My name is B. Kyle. I'm the president and CEO of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Grateful that you chose to brave the drive this morning. In, uh, I don't even see that we have too many folks who didn't join us, though, so we're very glad that you're here. Thanks for coming. So in partnership with the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce, I have the distinct honor of welcoming you to the 2019 Breakfast with the Mayors. <laughs> Before we get started, uh, one of our gifts to you, Minneapolis and St. Paul joined together to offer you your parking today. So you wouldn't have, yeah, no, that's a really round of applause, right? Please do pick up a voucher on your way out, though, so you can run it through uh, when you're, if you're down at the ramp. Some of you are locals and found street parking, in which case we can't help you. But for those of you who use the ramp, please. In the year since we were last together, a lot has changed. Our mayors no longer are new in their job, and I no longer am new in my job. But there's, there's still a lot of change going on, and indeed, ongoing change is an absolute certainty for us. And over the last year, we've had a lot of it. We continue to be called to engage in new ways if we are to remain relevant your chambers are representing you in our advocacy work, our economic development initiatives, our steadfast commitment to living out equity as we cast a wider net into the community. Indeed, people are asking for different things. Increasingly, they're saying, give me more choices and listen to me. To my mind, we needn't be afraid of change. Instead, we should be afraid of obsolescence should the opportunity for change pass us by. We have real partnership and opportunity in front of us, a partnership with cities led so capably by our two mayors, and we are grateful for your leadership, for your demonstrated support of business, because we all know that su successful enterprise drives opportunity and hope. And we're grateful for your partnership in driving your cities. Not every community has leaders who want to participate like you do. Now, this may sound like a speech, but it's really not. It's an invitation. We're inviting you to build on what's possible, and we must dare to be inspired. So again, I say welcome, and I look forward to being inspired by our speakers this morning. Next, I'd like to introduce our host, Dr. Julie Sullivan the president of the University of St. Thomas. We're so grateful for your hospitality. Dr. Sullivan is the 15th president, the first layperson and woman to serve as president of the university. And with campuses in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Rome, St. Thomas is a comprehensive university encompassing eight schools and colleges serving approximately 10,000 students and grounded in the liberal arts and Catholic intellectual tradition. It is in business, it is impressive that Dr. Sullivan has three degrees, including a PhD in business. But on an extremely cold Minnesota morning, it is especially impressive that he is, she is here because she is a native of Florida. <laughs> so if you would offer, join me in offering the warmest of welcomes for University of St. Thomas President Dr. Sullivan. Well, happy Tommy Tuesday. Those, many of you, I hope, uh, know about the tradition of wearing purple on Tuesday at St. Thomas. So those of you who are joining us in that tradition, we appreciate it. No, it really is a pleasure for me to welcome you here this morning. We are honored once again. We were, had the honor of hosting this breakfast last year, and we are honored once again to host both Mayor Carter and Mayor Fry here on our St. Paul campus, right next to the river that separates our two beautiful, beautiful cities. So thank you very much. And like many of the business leaders in this room, we do have a significant presence in both cities and a significant vested interest in the vitality of the communities in both cities. We, of course, do not want to show favorites, uh, but as no most of you know, we have grown up right here in St. Paul next to this river. Uh, Archbishop John Ireland founded the University of St. Thomas on this plot of land in 1885. At that time, he called this plot uh, far removed from town. So we were out in the boonies at that time. But that was one year after St. Paul was incorporated as a city and three years before Minnesota became a state. 
So we are certainly old friends with this community. Our founder, John Ireland, was an advocate for immigrants and for the poor. He shared many of the values that our mayors have been expressing and that our community is embracing. He saw education as the best way to build and strengthen community. St. Thomas still emphasizes a values-based education, and our university makes a significant contribution to the economic and social well-being of the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis, a commitment that we hold very strongly. Our mission is to prepare students to think critically, act wisely, work skillfully to advance the common good. And we believe there is a common good, and it is our responsibility to pursue it, not only in how we educate our students, but in how we commit ourselves as a university. And we continue to ask ourselves, does Ireland's vision and mission, what is it calling us to do today, right here in 2019? Currently, we have unacceptable att educational attainment gaps that exist in our Twin Cities area. Some Minnesota young people dream of a four-year education and the career it can pr pr provide them. And they don't have the academic preparation or the financial resources or maybe the social network or the parental guidance to get on that path, even though they do have the capacity to ultimately achieve it. At the same time, we have dire workforce shortages in our state. While many of our future jobs in this state do not require a four-year degree, and we need alternative pathways to prepare students for those jobs as well. But we do rank 10th in the country as a state in terms of the percentage of jobs that require a four-year degree in Minnesota. So St. Thomas is playing a role in ensuring the future strength of our workforce. And our newest uh, initiative along those lines is the Doherty Family College. The Doherty Family College, sorry, it's located in Minneapolis, for those of you on the St. Paul side, but like I say, we're invested in both. It enrolls 267 students from diverse and economically disadvantaged backgrounds, and almost all are first-generation students. They live right here in the Twin Cities. They all come from Twin Cities high schools. Our first class will graduate this spring, and the purpose of the Doherty Family College is to put these students on a path, a two-year path with extensive support services that will prepare them to finish that two-year degree and move into a four-year program, continue their education, and graduate with a four-year bachelor's degree. Thank you. I want to thank you, too, because the success of this uh, endeavor also depends on our ability to get these students out into the community and into professional work settings while they're with us. Many of you employ these students as interns, and we appreciate it very much. And those of you who would like to look into this, please feel free to contact us. So as B said, we are the largest private university in Minnesota. Uh, we comprehensive 10,000 students, business, law, education, engineering, arts and sciences divinity, social work, but maybe what you might not know is how many people we employ. So we employ in St. Paul 1,564 people, full-time, faculty and staff. And in Minneapolis, we employ 409 people. So we employ about 2,000 people in, the, in our two communities, and these communities are important to us. We also have about 110,000 alumni living alumni, and about two-thirds of them live in Minnesota. And as you know, with the concentration of population in Minnesota, many of those two-thirds are in the Twin Cities. So we believe that we are a part of creating and sustaining the common good of the Twin Cities, and we're very grateful for the strength of the two mayors that we have leading us today, Mayor Fry and Mayor Carter. So thank you very much for being here this morning. I don't want to get too far into the program without thanking our sponsors, without whom our event would not be possible. So please hold your applause until the end, if you would. Our presenting sponsor this morning is Target Corporation. Our series presenting sponsors are Goff Public and the University of St. Thomas. Our corporate sponsors are Comcast, the Minnesota Timberwolves, Mortensen Construction, Mystic Lake, Securian Financial, and Excel Energy. Our contributing sponsors are AT&T, Clearway Minnesota, 
Delwood Gardens, Assisted Living, Evergreen Energy, Larson King, Messerly Kramer, Milax Corporate Ventures, Minnesota Public Radio, and Platinum Bank. Please, if you would join me in thanking our sponsors. And now for a few words from our event presenting sponsor. Tracy Hester is a director of government affairs for Target Corporation and is responsible for creating and implementing Target's legislative agenda and building relationships in nine Midwest states, including Minnesota's corporate headquarters. Prior to joining Target, Tracy lobbied for the Twin West Chamber of Commerce, and she also has held positions at the Minnesota House of Representatives, the Arizona State Senate, and the Arizona Governor's Office. She is another warm weather woman from Arizona, so please welcome Tracy Hester. And as you heard in my bio, I am from Arizona, and um, there's weeks like this one is really why I moved here. You know, it's negative nine, we're feeling fine, right? Um, but you know, you don't move to a community just solely for the weather. And over uh, my 13 years at Target, I was very fortunate to have visited Minnesota many times. And what I found um, most appealing was the people. Um, in this community, I love the attitude there's, that Minnesotans have that are can do, no excuses. I mean, look at you, you're here at a breakfast during a polar vortex, so <laughs> kudos. Um, when I moved here, I told my children, when you go swimming, you need your goggles and you need your swimsuit. And when in the winter, you need your coat, your jacket, you know, rated to negative 45. But you, the point is that you just need the right gear. And lucky for me, I work for Target and we sell gear for every season. So Target, you know, it's the sixth largest employer in the United States. We 30 million people shop our stores each week. And we're headquartered in, Minas in Minneapolis, right over the river. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and we're the top employers in Minnesota. Um, last year, we invested, invested $250 million to reimagine about half of our portfolio here in the Twin Cities. And there's more to come in the next few years. And we understand that we don't, can't just invest in brick and mortar to enhance our brand. We also have to invest in our people. And so um, we. Also last year, increased our minimum wage to $12 an hour nationwide, and we're on the path to 15 by 2020. <laughs> Target also looks to be part of the fabric of community, and last week I was fortunate to join Mayor Carter and Mayor Fry at the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Washington, D.C. It was it, that, this conference brings together mayors from across the country who try to solve solutions to our nation's city's challenges. Um, our two mayors showed great leadership among, among their mayor, mayoral peers. Let me give you an example. Mayor Fry was part of a panel that was talking about local solutions to, to housing challenges facing our communities. And Mayor Carter was mentioned by Vice, former Vice President Joe Biden as a city that's tackling, that's investing in transit and in its spurring economic development. It's been amazing to see their rise and their leadership among their mayoral peers in such a short time. Um, I, and I can't wait to hear from them this morning. So to that end, I wanna thank you all for coming. And um, as you walk to your mode of transportation today, remember this is why you live here and Target has all the right gear for you. Well, good morning. I am Jonathan Weinhagen, President and CEO of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. Grateful to be here in the great city of St. Paul this morning and excited to welcome the main event. I'm gonna introduce our first mayor who will present this morning. They did do a coin toss and Mayor Fry opted to go first. Um, I learned that I would be introducing him about 20 minutes ago. They handed me a four paragraph bio to read that I am not going to read this morning. Um, what I can assure you is he's an impressive guy, right? So take my word uh, for that. Uh, great history, done lots of stuff. I'm gonna give you a brief Cliff's Notes version before I welcome the mayor up this morning. Um, if you had a chance to, to get to know Jacob at all, you'd know that he's fond of reminding us that he is not from here. Um, and he'd tell you that that's okay. And what has been fun to see over the course of his year as, as mayor um, and his um, years on the council before that is how he has adapted to this city that he loves. 
Um, he came here via the uh, Twin Cities Marathon. I saw Mike Logan in the crowd, uh, CEO who administers that race, and fell in love with this city and this region. Um, and has, you know, I think, spent every day since then showing us what it means to be a transplant who's here, who's committed to, to driving the work of this region and of these two incredible cities. He was a civil rights attorney, so that's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> Defeated a longtime incumbent for the third ward, so representing downtown Minneapolis before um, successfully winning his bid to be mayor in 2017. Since then, he's tackled some massive, massive issues and continues to be a champion for affordable housing, you know, addressing police community relations, and thinking about um, economic inclusion um, with regards to how we approach development. Um, he also still lets me into his office. Um, now, that may cease after this introduction, um, but we have built a strong partnership, a great friendship, and look forward to tackling the issues of economic vitality together. So with no further ado, welcome Mayor Jacob Fry. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Jonathan Weinhagen, for not reading the four paragraphs there. That was a pretty impressive rendition of my bio. Uh, and I cannot tell you how much we appreciate the partnership in all seriousness. Your work on everything from transportation to, to business growth to housing is absolutely crucial right now. And, and you are leading the way. And thank you to all the, the partners here for the Minneapolis uh, Chambers, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, for the regional chamber uh, breakfast with the mayors. I was on my way out this morning and my wife asked me where I was going and I said I was going to the breakfast with the mayors, and she said, yeah, so people actually show up to that thing? <laughs> she goes, Sakina, Melvin's wife, and I have had breakfast with the mayors, and trust me, it's not all that interesting. <laughs> so I also want to recognize the new Met Council Chair, Nora Slawick, if we could give her a round of applause. We very much look forward to working with you on, again, everything from housing to transportation. And also want to uh, give a, a huge round of applause to my good friend and colleague right here in St. Paul, Mayor Melvin Carter. You know, I, I could not ask for a, a better partner. You know, being mayor is, is tough. You, you get beat up at times, uh, but if you have a good partner in the region, you can, you can lead with a gigantic vision, and I, I'm so proud that that partner is indeed Mayor Melvin Carter. Uh, so in Minneapolis, over the last year, we can report some really great success. And we can have that great success because we are working in partnership with so many others throughout the region. Uh, we said from the very beginning that, that housing was a priority, and we decided to, to put our money where our mouth is, investing about three times the previous record in our city of $40 million uh, to go towards affordable housing. And not just, thank you. And not just housing at the traditional levels of 50 and 60 percent of area median income, we're making sure to to institute housing at that deeply affordable level so that people who are experiencing homelessness can pull themselves out. And if you've been following the news in Minneapolis over the last several months or so, yes, indeed, we do have a homeless and affordable housing crisis right now in our city, and we need to act upon it. And, you know, in addition to, to working on issues that you decide to work on affirmatively, inevitably there's also a series of challenges. We had a, a homeless encampment, uh, and I'm proud to, to report that we have moved forward with the Navigation Center, uh, and we are moving vigorously towards uh, long-term and stable affordable housing in our city. People who are experiencing homelessness need to be treated with compassion. We need to have a recognition of the dignity of every single human being out there. Uh, and I'm proud that the Twin Cities collectively right now are, are leading the way with that mentality. We also have a, an initiative called Stable Homes and Stable Schools. You know, we know that we're not going to ultimately have good business in Minneapolis unless we have the foundational elements of education, and we won't have those foundational elements of education unless every single kid has the foundation from which they can rise, that stable home, that place to go home to at the end of the night to rest their head on a pillow and to rejuvenate for the next day. 
Uh, and so we started a program card called Stable Homes, Stable Schools, recognizing that about 8.5% of our Minneapolis school-age population is experiencing homelessness, and an even higher percentage, an even higher percentage, is experiencing pretty severe housing instability. And so we wanted to make sure that those children had the stability that they deserve and have a place hopefully within a half mile radius of their home so that they can have those foundational elements uh, to ultimately succeed in school and so that the classroom succeeds as well. So we've got the train on the tracks with affordable housing and now we're working very vigorously towards economic inclusion in the coming year. And so economic inclusion is the implementation of specific solutions that unmake the legacy of institutionalized and sy systemic exclusion of people of color, immigrants and native communities, and furthers the economic and social independence of these communities. So this is the right thing to do. It's also the economically smart thing to do. We know right now that in our region, in our state, we have somewhere in the range of about 100,000 job vacancies. 100,000 job vacancies, which is a, a staggering figure. And if we don't make sure that every single person, every single community has, has access, but, not, but the, also the ability to scale a great idea, to become an entrepreneur, to live a brilliant life, then we as a region also stand to lose $31 billion by about 2040 which any good business person would tell you, is absolutely unacceptable. So we have a role to play, and the beautiful thing is that role needs to be played on a regional basis. That role needs to be played on a regional basis. And yes, that means working together as mayors in the Twin Cities. That also means working together as the chambers. And so I'm proud that there is this push happening right now, not to have this kind of parochial style. We have a breakfast in Minneapolis. We have a breakfast in St. Paul. Although we have the, this particular breakfast in St. Paul and the breakfast last year in St. Paul. <laughs> Next year, Melvin Carter, maybe we can head over to the city <laughs> of Minneapolis. And so uh, thinking regionally uh, is thinking intelligently. Uh, and thinking intelligently is ultimately going to be good for business. And so in the area of economic inclusion, we have several initiatives that we're pushing in this next year. Uh, one of the first big ones is, is cultural corridors. We want to highlight several corridors throughout our city that have a unique set of cultural identities. Uh, we want to make sure that on these corridors, you can walk down the street and there's a, a thousand different tastes and smells and sounds and people all packed in on the same street. We want to offer support for these businesses so that they can stay for the long haul, notwithstanding the rising values and in the increase in rents. Uh, and we want to ultimately then make sure that the assistance that we're providing to cultural corridors and the streamlining of the business processes and the licensing and the permitting is not limited to those corridors. We know that a whole lot of times by the time you get through the permitting and the licensing process, the capital that you initially had invested in whatever project it was isn't there. Uh, and so we need to streamline our processes, make sure that we're getting to yes and make sure that we're supporting the great ideas that all of you collectively have. Transportation and transit. Now, Jonathan has spoke extensively about it and has really been leading the way to, to ensure that people do have transportation access and access to a cornucopia of transportation options that we have in the Twin Cities, everything from light rail to, to BRT to pedestrian and bike to, yes, automobile. We want to make sure that people have a series of options to get from their home to work. And this is good business. It is good business to support transportation options in, in the Twin Cities because if we are going to become a world-class city, and if we are a world-class city, then transportation options are absolutely critical. Thank you. We've got a series of other things we're working on from Upper Harbor Terminal, making sure to connect North Minneapolis, a, a community that has traditionally been excluded for some of its most vital assets, including the riverfront, to it. We want to make sure that 
young people who have actual experience to, uh, to the riverfront. There are some young girls able to run through a field of dandelions and dip her toe in the Mississippi River, something that is not possible. So St. Paul's working on the Ford site, we're working on Upper Harbor Terminal, and collectively we've got a big vision for how to transform that riverfront. We're streamlining processes over at 311 to provide one-stop shops so that people can call in with any question from business licensing to assistance to navigating uh, the, the emergency snow system. They can all go to one place and they can get the information they need. Uh, public safety, obviously also critical. Pu uh, crime, by the way, is down right now, 20%, which we're, we're, we're thrilled about, and, and a la whole lot of that is due to the wonderful leadership of, of a great partner we have in Chief Arredondo uh, in Minneapolis. And so, as you know, and as I've said, Minneapolis does not operate in a vacuum. I will continue to work with our partners uh, across the river and across the state to make life for Minnesotans more equitable, more successful, more vibrant, and more connected. So I want to thank uh, everyone in this room for your continued partnership to make sure that our region absolutely thrives. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. I'm Tina Hoy. I am the 2019 chair of the board for the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce, and I have the honor of introducing my hometown mayor, Mayor Carter. Melvin Carter is a fourth generation St. Paul resident, St. Paul public school graduate, and former St. Paul city council member, father, and St. Paul mayor. Carter grew up in the Rondo neighborhood as the son of one of St. Paul's first black police officers, and a teacher who now serves as Ramsey County Commissioner. He attended St. Paul Public Schools, ran track at the Neighborhood Rec Center, and graduated from Central High School. He currently lives blocks away from where he grew up with his wife, Dr. Sakina Futrell Carter, and the youngest three of their five children. That is so a St. Paul story. My kids went to the same grade school I went to. We live close to my mother-in-law. That's St. Paul. <laughs> Carter has been working to engage, enfranchise, and uplift people not only in St. Paul, but all across the state and nation. Most recently, he served as executive director of the Minnesota Children's Cabinet, advising Governor Mark Dayton on early childhood policy. Prior to joining state government, Carter represented Ward 1 on the St. Paul City Council from 2008 to 2013. In the run-up to his campaign for mayor, Carter spent a year in conversation with neighbors through a series of listening sessions called Imagine St. Paul. His unconventional campaign focused on grassroots organizing and earning support from every corner of the city. Welcome, Mayor Carter. Thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be here with you on this uh, wonderfully warm St. Paul morning. I want to uh, thank uh, Mayor Fry for his comments and welcome you certainly to the city. Uh, glad you were able to find your way over here this morning. <laughs> Getting aside, you know, I always tell folks uh, that, uh, you know, despite what, you know, other examples may, may show for us, uh, this work is very much a team sport. Uh, and it's always an honor to have a teammate like you across the river, actually on our side of the river, as he always reminds me, he's on the, uh, this, he's on, he li actually lives on the east side of the river, uh, but uh, over there in Minneapolis working together and doing this work. It's an honor. Please give uh, Mayor Fry one more round of applause. We celebrated Martin Luther King Day last week, and you know it's weird because I, I, I've never been known as like a big cold weather guy. Uh, Martin Luther King Day is the one day of the year I feel like it should be freezing cold uh, and a blizzard, uh, and this is why because we grew up. Uh, every year on Martin Luther King Day, waking up and our parents would uh, get us all bundled up in our Target gear. <laughs> and we'd go out and march. And it always felt like that march against the cold, right? That march against the snow, that march through ice and you know whatever the elements were doing that morning uh, was a reminder that this world isn't just a, a walk in the park. Uh, you know, and, and, and my parents uh, had, had no mercy on us what, whatsoever. No matter how cold it was, uh, no matter how snowy it was, no matter how windy it was, uh, they would remind us 
uh, that walking a mile in seven below temperatures uh, is actually a significantly shorter walk than the walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And what I recall is on those cold days, on those windy days, uh, on those chilly days, uh, the way that we got through it, the only way to get through it, uh, was to lock arm in arm with the people next to us. And if it got really cold, we would pull each other really tight. The colder it was, the closer we had to stand together. And hopefully you weren't in the front row because <laughs> you'd sort of you know, burrow your head in behind the person in front of you. And it's just a reminder for me on some of these moments that feel divisive, that feel hateful, uh, that feel really unique in this country, that, you know, that, that's not just a metaphor, that the way we've gotten through moments like this, uh, and Minnesota has led the way with leaders uh, through every generation, from Hubert Humphrey to Paul Wellstone, uh, who have reminded us uh, that in our coldest moments as a country, those are the times where we have to remember to just pull each other even closer and uh, uh, keep each other warm. So uh, I, I, I digress. <laughs> and that is not what I was invited to speak about this morning. <laughs> But the cold made me think of that. Look, I'm excited to be the mayor of St. Paul. I'm excited for the opportunities we have for our region. I'm excited to do this work alongside Mayor Fry. I'm excited for all the partners that we have. I'm appreciative of the great work of our St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce and certainly our president, B. Kyle. Please give her a round of applause. If this is a team sport, uh, then I'm excited to report that we've got a great team. You know, we are poised, and the reason I'm excited, the reason I don't have to fake my excitement every single day for this work is because we are poised for incredible success as a community, and, and, and dare I say it, as a metro region. Mayor Fry and I always talk about the fact that we are going to have to choose at some point between competing against each other to be the best city in the state, which we know is no competition anyways, or working together to be a metro area of global significance. We choose the latter. We choose the latter. We can work together on these things. And one of the things that's, that, that, that I learned through that Imagine St. Paul process that was so important to me, one of the things that I learned is the fact that, you know, this old kind of Midwestern value that we have that says when you're really, really excited about something, the most important thing is that nobody knows it. that that's led us to shortchange ourselves. See, we're an even more incredible metro area. We're an even more incredible city. We're an even more incredible community than we dare to believe sometimes. And that leads us, I think, uh, to a wrong-headed approach toward city building, toward community building. You know, uh, Mayor Fry was talking about, always talks about seeing this community, the beautiful community it is, uh, through the lens of the, uh, of the Twin Cities Marathon. Uh, I've never seen St. Paul through that lens, <laughs> but maybe one day I will. I went to college in Florida, Florida a and University, and I always share with folks one of the most important lessons I learned in moving a thousand miles away was how amazing a community we have right here in Minnesota. You know, and I graduated from college, and because I'm a spreadsheet geek, uh, I pulled out my Excel uh, laptop and you know, started putting together all the things that I wanted in a community. And the more I did that, the more it became clear to me that there was no place I wanted to live, despite the weather outside today, that there was no place I wanted to live like this space. And so this is an incredible and exciting community. And we know that the Twin Cities, and certainly Minnesota, uh, have uh, two major things going on at the same time. One, we have an incredible amount of prosperity. We have an incredible amount of promise. We have an incredible amount of opportunity. And two, we have an enormous number of people who for too long have been locked out of that progress and prosperity. We are working to correct that. In St. Paul, in Minneapolis, uh, alongside our state government, 
we are working to correct that. You know, right now, we can still predict with an alarming and embarrassing degree of accuracy. We could walk through Regions Hospital in the birth ward and predict based on a child's race and zip code what that child's expected life outcomes are likely to be. That's not acceptable, not for a community as strong and as bright and as vibrant and as promising and as prosperous as us. So we are endeavoring in St. Paul to build a city that truly works for all of us. And that means thinking differently about who we are as a community. And that means thinking differently about the type of things that we do. One small change that we made this year, one small change with, I think, major implications, is we eliminated late fees in our St. Paul public library system. I'm glad that makes you happy because it didn't make everyone happy. <laughs> My wife always tells me not to read the comments, not to read the tweets. And I promise you if the folks who wrote those had any idea how much um, entertainment I get from them, they probably would stop writing them. But uh, when we did that, you know, Twitter uh, declared a war on personal responsibility. And uh, one, my, my favorite tweet was, somebody tweeted, uh, next thing St. Paul will be like that movie, The Purge, where once a week it's legal to kill people. <laughs> Which feels like that escalated very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that was four steps down the road, that wasn't next. But what we've learned about late fees in libraries are two things. One, they don't make people bring a book back. They make people stay away from the library for years. You know that, right? Be honest. If you've got late fees in the library, raise your hand. Honestly. No shame. If you're in St. Paul, you don't have those anymore. But two, people on one side of town and people on the other side of town don't bring books back later than each other. It's just that for some of us, a $12 late fee means a different decision about what we feed our children for dinner tonight. And when people for whom $12 represents a significant amount of money, when those folks aren't involved in our policymaking process, we'll never even see or understand or even know that a policy like that can make a difference. And so our goal is to bring people into the decision-making process. I say all that to say that I'm really proud of all the things that we've been able to accomplish in St. Paul in just the last year. We have invested heavily in our people. We have invested heavily in our children and families. We've invested heavily in our streets, our bike lanes, our sidewalks, and our infrastructure. We are investing in building the future for our community. I wanna share with you three quick things and I'll be out of, out of your way. Uh, three areas that I'm really proud of. One is housing. We know, and Mayor Fry mentioned this, uh, but we know that our housing crisis impacts every single classroom, every single neighborhood, every single block, every single workplace in our community. As we talk about what it means to be a great community, we visited a local business uh, just uh, last month. And we, uh, and, I, and I asked the entrepreneurs, I said, listen, what are the challenges to doing business right now? And I asked this question just about two weeks after signing a $15 minimum wage into law. And I expected that to be the answer because I know that that creates challenges and we've talked a lot about that. But that business person said, look, and they started telling me about an employee who they had, a good employee who they had, who they didn't even know was experiencing homelessness. And they said this employee uh, had a, was, was, was a, was a no-show, no-call, no-show uh, a couple of weeks before that. Uh, and they were really disappointed. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. And, and what they found out was that this employee was experiencing homelessness and had stayed that day at the shelter sitting on the front step to wait and try to make sure that he received his paycheck. And so our housing crisis that Mayor Fry talked about is impacting our ability to uh, our economy. It's, it's impacting our ability to educate our children. It's impacting everything. I see uh, members of our school board, our superintendents, uh, Joe Gothard here. Thank you so much for your service and being here. And I hear from our school board. I hear from teachers about the students who are trying to educate who move four and five times in one school year. That's not acceptable. So we've invested in an affordable housing trust fund. Uh, we in the city are going to be uh, committing uh, $71 million 
uh, to housing over the next three years. That's a big number for St. Paul by comparison to what we've done in the past, but as I'm sure Mayor Fry would tell you, it's a small number by comparison to the need that we have in our communities. And so we are looking forward to working with our state partners and our regional partners to address this regional critical need. And with that said, I also want to acknowledge uh, we have uh, uh, MHFA Commissioner Jennifer Ho here. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you here. Thank you for your service. Please. And listen, there's nobody more uh, prepared uh, to help us move into the future as a community. Uh, she, her service includes, her, her background includes work uh, at the White House, or I'm sorry, work in the uh, federal government uh, under the previous uh, administration, uh, and also overseeing the first federal plan to end homelessness. So we're in great hands. Thank you so much for your service and being back here in Minnesota with us. So our, that's our focus is connecting people to service and our, our, our housing plan is gonna really have three pillars. You know, I'm in politics, so if you can narrow something down to three bullets and they all start with the same letter, it's like God's work, right? <laughs> And so our first pillar is, um, is, is, is we're going to be um, um, producing new units, new housing units. We know that we need new units at all, at all levels of the income spectrum. We're going to be working to preserve existing units, both the kind of brick and mortar structure and also the affordability. And we're going to be working with our city council in the future on a host of fair housing protections. I'll tell you, as, uh, as Tracy was talking about uh, Mayor Fry's presentation on housing at the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, last week, uh, it, it was it it was an incredible presentation, uh, and we were talking to a couple of mayors, and somebody said, what, what are the new ideas on housing? Uh, and everybody agreed uh, that, uh, that, 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 that that mayor from Minneapolis was actually onto something. So uh, I'll, I'll give you some credit for once. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that. So we're working on that. We're working to ensure that our children have a bright future in front of them. I'll tell you the most exciting thing that we're working on right now is our college savings accounts proposal to put $50 in the bank to start every single child born in our city on the pathway to college from birth. Now, I was on a local comedy show this summer, and the comedian, the host, looked at me and said, huh, $50 for college, that might not be enough. <laughs> and we'll acknowledge that $50 is a seemingly small amount of money. But you know what we've learned is that children from low-income families and modern-income families who have literally more than $1 set aside in college savings when they graduate from high school are three times more likely to go to college. And when they do, they're four times more likely to graduate. See, it's not about the amount of money. It's about the, the, the powerful impact we make when we tell our children we believe in you enough to invest in you. See, I was 17 the first time anyone asked me if I was going to college. Some of you know my parents. In my house, the question was, which college are you going to? I was pissed off. I, they never told me it was optional. <laughs> but you know, we have a gap in our community in our expectations for our children. Our college savings accounts plan will tell every child in our community that we, that, that, that we expect and, 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 and we deserve, and, and, and we're gonna invest in your future beyond simply a high, school, uh, a high school diploma because we know that that's gonna be necessary as we continue to move forward. I'm excited about that. The third thing I wanna share with you uh, is our investments in our city's infrastructure. We are investing heavily in our city's infrastructure. We have actually doubled our budget uh, to what's called mill and overlay to repave our streets. Uh, we've doubled our budgets to support our sidewalks, and we've, ex we've uh, uh, adopted for the first time dedicated funding for bike lanes in our community as well, because we know that people need different ways to get around. As our communities expand and grow, St. Paul is, at, uh, is nearing an all-time high population with another 20 years of projected growth in front of us. We have to prepare our communities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, for thousands more families, thousands more students in our schools, thousands more people trying to get around our community, and how we connect to each other is critical. That infrastructure, I need a better word for infrastructure, 
because it ends up being kind of sounds like a boring word, but it's about how we connect each other to jobs, to schools, to opportunity, to visit a sick relative, to go to the grocery store. It's about how we connect our communities to ensure that we have opportunity for everybody. And so we're excited to do that. We're going to be looking to partner with our, with our uh, state uh, really heavily with a focus on the Kellogg Street Bridge uh, that connects downtown to the east side and everything east of St. Paul. That's going to be critical for us as we're going to be talking a lot at the legislature this year. And we'll look forward to your partnership as we do that uh, because that's an important part of ensuring that all of the east metro is connected uh, to, the, to the vibrancy and the prosperity of our region. That's critical for us. Uh, you also know we have a, a parking ramp in St. Paul. Have you heard about the parking ramp in St. Paul? Uh, that we are working to rebuild. We are continuing to work on that. Uh, we're going to be working with our partners uh, pretty diligently to do that. Uh, and we're in the process right now of rebuilding the vision uh, as, as far as that goes. So I say all that to say we have an important uh, opportunity in front of us. We're looking forward to working with Governor Waltz and the Waltz administration. We're looking forward to this notion of one Minnesota. And I believe that in St. Paul, in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, we can really show the rest of the country and the rest of the world that when it comes to finding solutions uh, that the other person, the other party, uh, people who look or, you know, different than us or practice different religions or speak different at home are not the problem. That we in Minnesota can show everyone that our, the key to our prosperity is really ensuring that we all do this together that we know and operationalize in the words of our late Senator Paul Wellstone, that we really all do better when we all do better. Thank you very much. I'd really love to invite Mayor Fry back up and open the floor to questions. I was so inspired and delighted. Isn't this just great to have mayors who have such impassioned things to say and you're all inspired when we leave? So thank you for your time and please, if you have questions, we have about five or seven minutes. Yes, any easy questions? <laughs> if I passed you a note card when I came in, raise your hand and ask that question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and stand up. Uh, Citizens League rules, we hold the mic, you ask the question. Okay, so that I don't... I could go. Um, so we've got a room full of business leaders here, and you both talked about the need for addressing the housing shortage or the housing crisis. What role do you see for business in addressing that? Well, I'll start out and say housing is one of those issues where everybody kind of recognizes what the solution is at the macro level, but as soon as you start talking about implementing that solution anywhere in the vicinity of where they live, there's pushback. <laughs> and that comes in the form of affordable housing, it comes in the form of density, it comes in the form of change, because sometimes the only thing that people hate worse than the status quo is any change at all. And in, in this case, yeah, some change is necessary. It's necessary for people of lower incomes. It's necessary for business. We can't expect to increase our, our workforce to address the needs of a modern day economy unless we have the housing to allow for it to be addressed. Uh, and right now, we are way short. I mean, you got vacancies somewhere hovering around like one and a half or two percent right now uh, in rental vacancies. Um, we have a, a supply epidemic, which leads to increased prices, um, and that impacts everything from affordable housing to mid-range to even high-end. Uh, and so I think one of the big parts for us to recognize right now is, is, is density is a good thing. It's not a four-letter word. Uh, it's something that we collectively in the Twin Cities need to be pushing for. Uh, and it's got to go, I mean, M Mayor Melvin Carter has, has stood out boldly on this particular topic. We've initiated a, a comprehensive plan in Minneapolis that allows for a diversity of housing options in, ev in every neighborhood. Uh, but it's got to be all of us saying, like, yes, in our backyard. Yes, we want to live with a beautiful diversity of socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, because that ultimately is when great entrepreneurship is going to take place, that's when great ideas come together, and that's when our cities are collectively really going to rock. Yeah, I, I would certainly just uh, co-sign that, um, and I'd say, you know, if, if 
if employees in your business are not facing housing challenges, uh, then it's really just that you don't know that they are, uh, because they are. Uh, people in our community really are, and, and I think it'd be incredibly helpful for business leaders to stand up uh, and share the extent. Uh, well, first, talk to your employees and understand the extent to which uh, our housing crisis is impacting your business, uh, and share that out loud at the Capitol and community as we advocate for that. And secondly, I'd, I'd co-sign exactly what uh, Mayor Fry said, in particular with regard to the conversation about density. Density is about uh, using our land more efficiently. It's about uh, maximizing and capitalizing on our tax base. Uh, it's about preparing our community uh, for our growth, uh, which we want. Uh, that growth is positive and it's good. Uh, and that's an opportunity. I think that's an area where we have an opportunity to partner more closely with our business community because those are all shared goals. Thank you both. Um, I'm Laura Bloomberg. I'm the Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And one of the things we're seeing, um, and it may be a temporary trend, but an increasing number of our students are um, aspiring to go into uh, local and state government roles as opposed to heading to DC for a federal government role. And we talk about that, uh, and one of the things that students are saying is we're thinking a lot about how cities are going to maybe have more of an impact on things like climate change, um, trade with our partner Canada to the north, um, or immigration policy than some of the things we're seeing coming out of Washington. And I'm just wondering how, how you think about that and how that shapes either of your roles as a mayor in thinking about the things that um, maybe we would have looked to the federal government for before, like the Paris Climate Agreement, mm -hmm. as an example. Mm -hmm. Dean, it's wonderful to see you. I'm a product of the Humphrey School, as I know you know, so it's always wonderful to see you, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, you're right. Uh, that, that's why I'm passionate about local government. You know, uh, To me, local government uh, has uh, impact on our lives uh, that's direct, uh, that's immediate, uh, that's intimate. Uh, and as we see right now, you mentioned the Paris Climate Accords. Look, Mayor Fry and I are two of uh, a group of mayors from across this country who, when President Trump pulled America out of the Paris Climate Accords, uh, uh, hundreds of mayors got together and said, no, America will keep our commitments there. And you know, the, the way it works is if 200 mayors say America is going to do something, uh, we're doing it. And so you know, at the local level, we have, I think, opportunities to get things done. Uh, we have opportunities, and I think we're, we're rethinking across the country uh, because, frankly, of some of the paralysis we've seen in Washington, D.C. We see mayors rethinking uh, the, the, the local role and city's role in things that have traditionally been uh, in the space of the federal government. Uh, both of us are, 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 have planted work on immigration. Uh, in our cities. Both of us are working on climate change. Uh, you know, Bloomberg uh, Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies did a big Climate Cities Challenge grant this year, uh, and Minneapolis and St. Paul were winners of that challenge. Uh, and so we're working diligently, we're working together, uh, and I think uh, as we move forward, cities are going to continue to become uh, more and more relevant uh, in all of the conversations that we have. That's one of the reasons that I'm in a city, that's one of the reasons I ran for mayor, and that's one of the reasons I'm excited for what's ahead ahead uh, for us, and we have the, the benefit in our region uh, where most metropolitan areas uh, have one major city at the center. We have the benefit of having two major cities uh, that we can work together. I will add uh, just briefly uh, in co-signing everything that Mayor Melvin Carter just said that we, we're, we're in the position right now where we have some gridlock at federal and occasionally state governments. Uh, we have everything that's happening at the federal level right now and with this administration. And uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul are in the position to kind of be this laboratory of democracy uh, where we can, you know, think outside the box. We can challenge the regular standard norms and we can do some really extraordinary things. And it was really cool just this last week to be at the U.S. Conference uh, of Mayors with, with Melvin in that uh, we got there and I felt like we were the bells of the ball the whole week. <laughs> You know, I, I did a little housing symposium. Mayor Melvin Carter got called out by the Vice President of the United States. Uh, and I think it was some affirmation that the work that we are doing here in the Twin Cities is not just like state leading, it's nation leading. 
Uh, and it's not like we are just doing the work ourselves. This is, this is kind of work that's happening on the collective that our region is putting together, and people are really taking notice. This is not just a pretty good set of cities in the upper Midwest. We, we are world class here. And, you know, it was things were going so well, and we were getting so much credit, and we were riding so high that I decided, you know, I got to, like, throw a jab here and there. Uh, and so we were, um, we were actually over meeting our delegation, um, uh, and uh, I, I noticed as I was sort of driving back, I was meeting our delegation, and I noticed, oh, I, th I think that's, that's Mayor Melvin Carter, and he was walking around with like, just, uh, by himself with his, with, his, with his cell phone, kinda, I don't know exactly what he was doing, I assume he was looking Long for a ride short, or something. Long story short, I was walking down the street, and some rude person opened the window of a car driving past and yelled, St. Paul sucks! <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh, that's not funny. Yeah. And I thought right before I said that, that maybe this would be a childish joke, but I'm gonna do it anyway. But St. Paul got the last laugh because they stopped and picked me up, and I got a ride back to the hotel courtesy of Minneapolis taxpayers. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that maybe he wouldn't recognize who called, and so I ducked down right after I said St. Paul sucks. Five seconds later, I get a call on my cell phone and says, Yo, can I get a ride? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we want to be respectful of everybody's time, so I think we're going to leave it there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can't, you can't get any better than that, you right? You don't want to go beyond that? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't see what's so. next. Help me in thanking these two welcome yeah. gentlemen for coming today. Thank you. Well, we do have a rich tradition at both of the chambers of keeping us on time and on schedule and getting you out into the cold um, where you all belong. Um, before we do that, um, I had a lot of feelings this morning as I woke up and got ready for this event um, that we host every year. And one that really stuck with me was um, that our dearly departed friend, Doug Hennis, is not here this morning. Um, we lost Doug far too soon last year. Doug loved this university. He loved these cities, I would concede he loved St. Paul a little bit more. Um, he loved the neighborhood that was a pain in his butt around this institution. He loved the people in this room and he loved this event. In fact, he is the reason that we are here. He wrestled it away from town and country. Um, it wasn't so much a suggestion as a, you're going to host it at the Anderson Center or else. <laughs> Doug left such a lasting mark um, on so many of our lives and on this this community, and I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate Doug's legacy, a legacy that I think we see living on in our leaders, that we see living on in these cities, and that I know we will see living on uh, long beyond um, all of our time. So join me in a, a cheerful round of applause for Doug Hennis. I want to I want to thank Mayors Fry and Mayor Carter um, for being here this morning, for sharing their thoughts and their vision, their effervescent passion for this region um, that we all care deeply about, um, and also for their partnership. There is an incredible amount of work to do together. Um, I don't know if B was having the same sentiment that I was, wishing that the mayors would just like blanket co-sign onto stuff that we recommend, but maybe we can work on that. Um, but it's great to see the partnership, uh, the, the regionalism that's happening in this room today and that's happening um, each day from there on. I want to thank all of our sponsors today. As you know, without the investment of um, those great folks, we couldn't host programs like this. So thank you for your commitment to our organizations, to investing in and supporting our work. And then certainly want to thank all of you for braving the cold, for spending some time with us this morning. Um, as you depart, make sure to swing by a Target to gear up. Um, B, Mayor Carter, uh, Mayor Fry and I are going to uh, get matching jackets, I heard. Is that true? Target jackets, right? Cool. And then make sure you grab your parking voucher on the way out. Um, it will speed up the process of getting out of the parking ramp. So we want to make sure that everybody's day goes off without a hitch. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you at our next events. I always encourage you to visit the, the Chamber's websites to check out what's up next. And certainly make sure to mark your calendars. Um, I don't know that we have a date for this event next year, but you know, plan for it sometime around this time of year because we'd love to see you again. Have a great day. <laughs>